morning when I came up here, there's a timer on the pulpit. If it wasn't here this morning, maybe that's a sign. I do again want to say thank you for the invitation to be here and the privilege of being able to stand before you this week. I want to especially say thank you for the uh, wonderful lunch that we had. Everything was so delicious and I overindulged and so I'd like to formally repent. But that's a pretense because I'll probably do the same thing next time. Not seriously. A couple years ago I got the invitation to go with Brother Johnny Oxendine to England to preach and do some lectureships there. When I did, that was my first experience with what's called Travelex, a company. Now, it's difficult, some places will accept it, but it's difficult to just spend plain old green American dollars in the UK. And so what you do is you go to the little booths, they have them, a few of them in malls, but uh, in the airports, and you offer to exchange money for currency of another country. Of course, they don't do this out of the kindness of their heart. They scrape a little bit off the top for themselves. But it's interesting talking about that and noticing how the rates fluctuate. And then also how when we were booking accommodations, how the rate changes would affect the price that we were going to pay. Even though it might be the same number of pounds in the UK, it might be a different number of dollars. And the reason that those change is because of what people value. You're talking about putting a value on something. And those values may not stay the same when it comes to the differences in currency, and that's based on a lot of different things. We understand the idea of values. We understand that if we're going to make trades, then you value certain things. And we're not talking about cold, hard cash. I tell you that I'm going to trade you three goats for your bull. You know, you might say, well, this bull is worth way more than three goats. And so you understand values and how they factor in to the decisions that you make. It always interests me that when you read the book of Matthew, that Matthew, having previously been a tax collector, he always has his, his eye on the dollar and how often he notices specifics that deal with money. And so that's through the book of Matthew, and it's there. But when you're talking about values, you notice some things that people value, obviously the tangible things. You know, you have indexes that you use. What are the commodities prices? How much is gold going for? What's it cost to get a loaf of bread or, or milk? And those are the simple things to understand and values, but other people value things more than money. Some people value power. Some people value love. Some people value just simply free time. And people value different things, and different people value different things differently. Some of those things are bad, and some of those things are not wrong in themselves. But nonetheless, we're very familiar with the concept of values, even when we're talking about abstract things. In the book of Matthew, in chapter 16, the disciples are going to have an exchange with Jesus in which they begin to understand certain values. And the first of those takes place in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, in this exchange, they learned the value of other men's thoughts. Sometimes, if you're going to preach in a certain context, it's helpful to understand what people believe. Some people ask, well, why do you study false doctrines? Well, I want to know how they think. A good example of this is when you read the letters of the Apostle Paul. If you go and you look at historical studies to the recipients of his letters, it becomes very clear that Paul was in their head. He understood what they were thinking, and it allowed him to almost do surgical strikes to deal with the errors that they had, the problems in thinking that that got in the way of them receiving the truth. And so there is some benefit to that. And so in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13, the Lord at least saw not just a benefit in seeing what other men said, but seeing what the disciples thought about what other men said also. And that was an important step in the process. And so sometimes you have to ask yourself, well, what is it that I believe? What is it that people say? And how are the two the same? And how, it, how are the two different? And so he deals with the value of other men's thoughts. Now they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. They were familiar with the narratives of the day. But they weren't guided by those. What is the value of other men's thoughts? 
Well, Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, Jeremiah said, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his steps. In other words, we don't have the right to just decide what we believe and say that it's true and operate on that, on that basis. That's going to lead us astray. In Exodus chapter 23 and verse 2, Moses wrote to the children of Israel, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. So they didn't say, well, you know, this is like one of the polls that we hear about. Uh, 73% believe that you're uh, Elias and, uh, you know, 14% believe that you're one of the prophets. So, we, you know, it's pretty much in. That's not how they determine things. We don't determine what is truth based on what other people say and whatever metric involves what other people say, whether it's the majority or just some big name person that believes that. That's not how it is that you decide what is truth. You have to understand men's thoughts in their proper context. The point here is that these conclusions should be rejected if they don't line up with truth. And it's important to understand what the truth is in order to evaluate these claims correctly. In Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 9, Jeremiah writes, The wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord, and what wisdom is in them? Now I like the way that that last little thing is said. Sometimes I read books written by denominational people. Sometimes I li listen to lectures spoken by denominational teachers, people who teach false doctrine. But I'm always asking myself the same question that's here. Do I turn this on expecting to hear great wisdom, or do I turn it on trying to hear what it is that they think? And those are two different ways of listening to something. And there's one way that's prescribed by the Bible and one way that's condemned by the Bible. What is it that I expect to hear? I'm afraid that when people go to the movies, when they turn on the radios, when they listen to songs, they're trying to uh, build themselves up into an emotional frenzy so that they can have some sort of uh, existential epiphany. They're going to go sit down and watch a movie and they're going to learn the truth about all things. This is just a story that somebody made up and they're using special effects to sell it to you as if it were something real. When you sit down to watch that movie, if you sit down and say, no, I'm going to be entertained, that's fine. But if you sit down and you say, I'm going to learn the truth about my life, you're going to have a problem. You think all of those, those country singers are going to lead you in the paths of righteousness? You think all of those uh, rock singers are going to lead you in the ways that are right before the Lord? You think that the people who make these silly romance stories are going to show you how it is that you need to conduct your life and order your house? The same thing is true when it comes to religious teachers. You should consider their thoughts, but they ought to be discounted in light of the truth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 5, a passage that we talked about this morning, the Apostle Paul said that he was preaching the truth that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's the basis for our faith. Our faith is not built on how we feel about it. Our faith is not built on how somebody else feels about it. Our faith is built on what it is that God has set forth for us in his word. And so we turn to it for righteousness. In, Matthew, in Mark chapter 14 and verse 56, when the Lord was on trial, if you want to call it that, you find that many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. I'm fascinated when you look out in this world and you find people talking about unity. Unity, unity, unity. And you're sitting there with them and you ask this person, well, what, you know, what do y'all teach about baptism? And they say one thing and you talk to this group and they're sitting there holding hands and talking about, what do you teach about baptism? And they teach another thing. It sounds to me like you don't have much unity, do you? They have as much unity as the people who are testifying against Jesus. And that tells you very plainly what camp they find themselves in. There are people who believe the truth about Jesus, and there are people that do not believe the truth about Jesus. And it's the people that do not believe the truth about Jesus and what he stood for that you read about here in Mark chapter 14. The second thing that you find in Matthew chapter 16, and more importantly, is the value of divine knowledge. I've already tipped the hand and talked about this and how it compares to the thoughts of men. But in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16, Simon Peter, and this is the same reason we love Simon Peter and dislike Simon Peter, because without any reservation, he just blurts it out. But in this case, we like him. Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's got it. He knows the truth. Now you can ask yourself, without reading verse 17, how did he learn these things? 
On what basis did he make this determination? He was right about it. Evidently, he knew something about the law of Moses, and that worked in his favor. He had been listening to at least some of the things that Jesus Christ was preaching, and he saw how the Lord was a fulfillment of those prophecies of the Old Testament. He had seen how it is, just like Nicodemus had seen in John chapter 3, that the things the Lord was doing confirmed the things that he was saying. And the Lord was claiming for himself to be the Christ, the Son of the living God, in plain language. So we learn the value of divine knowledge. Now, the Word of God is our source for divine knowledge. Now, you and I are not going to go and hang out with Jesus physically and, and walk the earth with Him. That's not what we're going to do. We're not going to uh, get on our cell phones and dial up the number of one of the apostles and have a, a direct line like that. Nor is it the case that the Holy Spirit is going to zap supernatural information in our brains. That's not the way that He operates. There was a time when He revealed things directly. But that time has passed that you read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And it would be looking backwards to try to rely on that. But the word of God is our source for divine wisdom. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 and following, we have a divine commentary on this concept and how it all works. The Apostle Paul, following up what he had previously said about how it is that their faith should stand, he says in verse 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world. There is a wisdom of this world. And sometimes it works on a practical level, but you're not going to know spiritual things by having that wisdom. And he says, Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now, this mystery and hidden wisdom is not mysterious in the sense that we think about mysterious things. It's not an esoteric, uh, an ineffable statement. It's not something that you can't grasp. What he's talking about here in it being a mystery and a hidden thing is it's just something that was simply unrevealed. There are a lot of things I know now that I didn't know the day before. And I learned them. It doesn't mean they were unknowable or, or mysterious. It just meant that I didn't know them. And likewise, exactly how the scheme of redemption would operate wasn't fully revealed until the New Testament. Exactly what the church was going to look like, it wasn't revealed until the New Testament. And so these things were a mystery. And he goes on and he says in verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And then in verse 9, he says, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now sometimes you go to a funeral. And somebody's going to stand up and they're going to read this text and let's say, well, see, that's talking about heaven. And it's not talking about heaven. It's talking about the word of God. It's talking about the doctrine of Christ. It's talking about how it is that you and I could know the wisdom which comes from God. And he's telling us it was before unrevealed, but now it's revealed. You couldn't have thought it up on your own. You couldn't have performed all the mental industry and come to the correct conclusions about these things on your own apart from revelation. And he says, I have not seen nor he heard, neither have entered in the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Talking about the apostles, not Jeff, not Michael, not Brother Brantley, not any of the rest of us. Talking to the apostles, he has revealed these things by his Spirit. And so the apostles had the doctrine of Christ. And then he says in verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Now, let me do this. I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 100. Now, statistically, you have a 1% chance of getting it right. I think. I'm not good at math, but I think that I'm right about that. But you tell me what number I'm thinking of. You don't know. I'm thinking of the number 37. But that was in my spirit before I told you. Now it's outside of my spirit because I've spoken these things. Now you know the number that I was thinking of. Now, you can't use all of your mental industry and imagine for yourself exactly what the scheme of redemption would be like. That was a mystery. It was hidden. And it was in the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God has chosen to speak through His Word and reveal those things to us. You want to know what God thinks? You go to the Bible and you read it. And that's what he continues to talk about. As you continue on in verse 12, he says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things which are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. This is a textbook example of what's called an ellipsis. 
And the old American standard has it right, combining spiritual things with spiritual words. The apostles would take those spiritual things and they would reveal them in words given by the Holy Ghost so that people like us in the church in Corinth could have God's conclusion on the matters which were causing division in the first century. And so the second thing here is that you have to appreciate the value of divine knowledge. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 16 and 17, in the explanation of the parables, the Lord said to his disciples in verse 16 of Matthew 13, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. We ought to be thankful that we have printed copies of the Bible for ourselves so that we can know the mind of God on these things. I don't think that a lot of people appreciate what a great blessing and privilege that is. And so we should appreciate the value of divine knowledge. In John chapter 20, verses 28 through 31, the Lord was talking to his disciples. Now some of them had known the Lord Jesus by seeing him. And you know how it is with Thomas, you know, I'm not going to believe until I see the physical evidence. But as you continue on in verse 30 of John chapter 20, you see that many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe. You can read what is written and have knowledge that is equal to somebody who has seen with their eyes. Because that's what God wants for us. And this is the choice that he has made and how he's going to reveal his will to us. And that's a choice. Sometimes I get in a conversation uh, with a Calvinist and I say, God in his sovereignty has chosen to give us free choice. They don't know what to do with that because sovereignty is everything for them. And they say that God can't do that. But then that violates his sovereignty. And it's kind of a little little meltdown for kicks and for fun. But this is the way that God has chosen to do it. God in his sovereignty has chosen to let his spirit work on us through his word. Not by direct operation. This is the way that he's chosen. And if you are against that, you're arguing with God's sovereignty. It doesn't work. The third thing is that these disciples learn the value of practical application. Now, in this particular case, they put all the evidence together and they made the conclusion, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that was good. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 15, he saith unto him, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. But the disciples on other occasions, they lacked this ability to make the proper application. Now stay with me right there in Matthew chapter 16. Notice what happens in verse 5. When his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. This is almost immediately after feeding the multitudes on a previous occasion. Jesus said unto unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now, rather than just ask him outright, what are you talking about? Like good students. They go and they went and huddled off in a corner. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread, which when Jesus perceived, I mean, he's a savvy teacher. He knows what the kids are doing. He said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not understand? It's loud and clear what's going on here. You guys failed to understand what I'm talking about. And he tells them that they don't understand. He continues on. He says, neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up. Listen, guys, bread is not the issue here. He's trying to warn them about something very important for their own souls And then later on for the work that they were going to be doing as apostles. And he says in verse 10, Neither the seven loaves of the 4,000, how many baskets you took up, how is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning the bread, that you should beware of the leaven of Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Then understood they how that he bade them not to be aware of the leaven of the bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You have to beware of false teachers. Now, he's not talking about physical things here, but they didn't make the application to what he was warning them against. And they need to have that ability to make the proper application. Later on in Matthew chapter 16, Peter, after making the proper application, you're the Christ, son of the living God. Everything's good, right? 
He still failed in his ability to make proper application. The Lord himself tells him what's going to happen in verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and be killed and raised again the third day. I don't think you could be any plainer than that, that this is what's going to happen. Can you imagine what this conversation actually looked like in real time? You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, that's good that you understand that. Now let me tell you what's about to happen. And he tells them in the plainest terms. And then in verse 22, Peter responds like this. Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. He's calling him Lord while he's telling him he's wrong. I think that's a failure in application, don't you? They didn't understand the nature of sin and the price that was, was needed to pay for that sin. So Peter didn't understand the scheme of redemption. Well, the Lord responded to him in verse 23. He turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me. Referred to him as Satan. And he talked about valuing the things of men over the things of God. But Christ calls for us to make proper application. In the time that I was doing work full time as a preacher, I never stopped being surprised. I guess that's not entirely true. I think about Jesus a lot of times when the Bible says that uh, he marveled. And I realized that he knew what was in man and, and he, he understood things. And so he may not have been legitimately surprised, but it's kind of like when you see a couple of kids playing out in the backyard and one of the kids goes and picks up a stick and you say out loud, he's going to whack that other kid. And then he whacks the other kid. And the first thing you say is, I can't believe he just did that. Well, that's the way that I feel when you get these calls and people will read something in their Bible. They say, quit doing adultery, quit committing adultery. And they'll read that and they'll call up the preacher at a church building. They'll say, does this really mean that I have to quit committing adultery? And, and then I feel a little bit like Jesus did when, uh, when he talked about John the Baptist. What went you out to see? Well, why didn't you call a preacher? Uh, call somebody else. They'll tell you anything you want to hear. But people, their questions are really this. Does God expect me to do the things that he said he expects me to do? Do I really have to make an application with the things that are contained in God's word and his infinite wisdom. He revealed these things to me about how I need to live my life. Do I really have to do it? Should I really do that? Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that you should. I just don't think that God would want me to be unhappy. And you hear people say things like that. What does it mean to take up your cross? What was a cross? It wasn't a vacation. It wasn't a high point in his life. Pun intended. For effect's sake. What do people think when they read this? Later on, the, uh, the Pharisees themselves, in Matthew, uh, earlier, the Pharisees themselves, in Matthew chapter 16, notice what's said about them. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. They show up and they say, um, okay, Lord, why don't you give us a sign from heaven? If you're really the Messiah, it's really difficult to see. Galilean fishermen can see it, but these educated Pharisees and Sadducees were unable to see that, and so they were going to require a sign, right? So... They've thought this up. It's a pretty sophisticated uh, question, and this is going to seal the deal for them. He answered and said unto them, verse 2, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. In the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but ye cannot discern the signs of the times. And then he calls them wicked and adulterous generation. He says, I'm not going to give you another sign. There have been plenty of signs already done. And the entirety of the Old Testament is there to tell them this is the Christ. You remember Herod gathered together uh, the educated people and they were able to conclude precisely where Jesus was going to be born. The evidence was already there. They didn't want it. And so in rejection of the evidence, he says, the only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonas. Well, that's talking about the resurrection, about how he's going to be in the earth three days. It fascinates me, by the way, how it is that previously in this particular chapter that when Jesus responded to uh, Peter that he calls him Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon son of Jonah. Interesting how that works out, isn't it? You think he's calling to mind any of these things? 
The evidence is in, but they couldn't see it. This reminds me of when, when you turn on, you're going to watch the Weather Channel, and it's just pouring down rain outside. Sheets of rain are coming down. The water's three foot high in the parking lot, and the weatherman's saying, there's a 70% chance of rain. I'm not going to invite that guy to the gospel meeting. He doesn't need it. He's going to be just fine. God's going to take care of him. But the way the Lord talks to these people is, you can understand the weather. And there's more evidence for this than there is the weather. That Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God. And you show up and say, let's have a sign. Their failure was a failure to make practical application to the information they had. And a lot of times in the world today, whether it's in the church or whether it's denominational world or with the world at large, it's just a failure to deal with the facts. You talk to people and they've never considered what's going to be the case, what's going to happen to them when they're laying in the casket or when their body is laying in the casket. You, you talk to people and you say, what's going to happen when you die? And their eyes go off into a, a, a glaze like they've never thought about the fact they're going to die. And it's the undeniable kink in all of human philosophy that someday you're going to die. What's that all about? I think it's important. I think it's important not just because of understanding the gravity of the situation as revealed in the Word of God, but I think it's important just from the standpoint of understanding that everybody faces it. What does it mean? What's going to happen? And people don't make the practical application. The fourth thing is the value of a proper foundation. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, after the confession made by Peter, the confession being that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Lord says in verse 18, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know what that rock was? That rock was the fact that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus himself is the foundation. I think a lot of times people don't understand that, and you're probably familiar with the Catholic doctrine saying that Peter is the rock when Peter's name means pebble. But the Lord was going to build on a bedrock, and precisely that bedrock was the fact that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the truth upon which all things are built. As you think about the previous point of practical application, you probably ought to think about what you read in Matthew chapter 7 about the difference between the wise man and the foolish man. The wise man is one who does what? He's the one who hears the sayings, that's not all, and he does them. Those are the two components of the wise man. Well, how is it that the Lord is going to explain what the wise man is? He is like unto one that builds his house upon a rock, upon a proper foundation. Now, I like what you find in Luke's account in Luke chapter 6 and verse 48, when he says, He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. Now, we're familiar with the concept, how it is that a good building needs a good foundation. I don't know about you and how it is around here, but you listen to radio broadcasts and it seems like every third advertisement on the radio broadcast is for somebody promising to fix your foundation. And that's fine. That's good. It shows us the need for a proper foundation. And the, the danger to your structure is pretty serious if your foundation isn't right. And so this person was concerned about proper foundations. And the Lord says, that's the kind of person who is a wise person. The disciples needed to value a proper foundation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11, the apostle Paul wrote, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He himself personally, being the Son of God, is the foundation for the church. Now, people in their scheming, they try to come up with other things. You have all these churches out there, and just like this morning, they don't have the right name. I don't remember why I said it or not. I walked away thinking I didn't say it, but I was thinking that Juliet is wiser than a lot of people on this earth because she understands that denying the name means denying the Father. You think about how it is that God the Father is our Heavenly Father, and you think about somebody willing to say, well, I'm not a Christian, I'm something else. If you deny the name, who is your Father? But you think about how it is that people try to build on other foundations when the Lord was talking about himself being the foundation. That's why it's referred to as the church of Christ. Now, whose church do you want to be a member of? Jesus Christ says, I will build my church. But that's built on the proper foundation, which is the next point. The value of the one true church. I don't think enough people appreciate this. Martin Luther did not die for my sins. 
Ulrich Zwingli didn't die for my sins. John Calvin did not die for my sins. David Koresh didn't die for anybody's sins. Oh, he died as a consequence of his own sins. <laughs> That's for sure. And I'm sure that there will be a lot of people who do that. But there's one person who died for my sins, and that is Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. And as you think about what you find in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again on the third day. We start to understand the value of the true church by understanding the purchase price. Somebody says, well, you know, that's a nice car. And you say, it ought to be. I paid enough for it. We're assigning a value to things. Now, sometimes money is not the ultimate value. You can sometimes buy a cheap car that just starts every time you turn the key. And that's a great thing. There's a value in that. But you understand that what I'm talking about, when we're talking about the church, there is only one. A limited number of things obviously increases the value, doesn't it? There's only one church. And we understand the price that was paid for that church was the blood of Jesus Christ, the sinless one, who himself did no sin. There was no guile in him. He didn't suffer for anything he had done himself. You remember those thieves on the cross when one is ridiculing the other. He said, don't you fear God? He admitted we deserve to be here, but he talked about Jesus as being one who was innocent. And Jesus Christ chose to pay that price. He chose to die on that cross. His own volition. He allowed himself to be put on that cross because of sins. That's the purchase price of the church. You find the Apostle Paul said it this way in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. What are you willing to give your blood for? Oh, without hesitation, I would shed it all, every single drop of it for my kids. I may not do it for your kids. I value mine more than yours. I'm sorry, I'm sure they're nice kids. Some people are willing to give their blood for political ideals. And sometimes that's noble and sometimes it just makes them a scoundrel. But we understand the gravity of the situation when somebody is willing to pay with blood. And Jesus Christ looked at us who were yet in our sins, not just people. In fact, this is what Romans chapter 5 talks about. In while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's how he purchased the church. You ask what it's worth. I'm saying you can't put a value on it past the blood of Christ. He spent everything worldly have he had purchasing the church. And nobody can do that for you. And so when people come along and they try to say, well, you know, my church is the greatest church. Well, tell me about your church. Well, you see, back in 1517, this guy thought something up. I say, that's not the church I read about in my Bible, and there's no power in that blood. It didn't accomplish anything. And there's not salvation located within that church according to the doctrine of Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 shows us that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. And to be in Christ is to be in the church, as you continue on through the book of Ephesians. But Jesus Christ purchased the church with his own blood, and it's a heavenly kingdom. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19, he says to the disciples, he says, I will give unto thee, speaking particularly to Peter, give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Well, you see this happening. They spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And you read about that in Acts chapter 2. And they proclaimed the doctrine of Christ in its fullness, in the terms of entr entrance into the heavenly kingdom. They realized their sins. They made a practical application. When he said, ye with wicked hands have crucified, they said, that means us. That was good. That was to their benefit. And they were able to formulate, formulate the right question. And they said, men and brethren, what must we do? And Peter told them, repent and be baptized for their remission of sins. There was a purpose attached to that command, by the way. But the purchase price of the church is important. It's a heavenly church, and it's one that's not going to be destroyed. You think about how it is that these denominations in the world, every member of it could pass from this life, and all their books could be burned. But the Lord's church is going to stand forever. Forever. 
is the kingdom which cannot be destroyed that we read about in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. But this brings me to my next point. The next thing the disciples learned was the value of man's estate. Just like I've been talking about, people come up with all kinds of schemes for salvation. They sit around, they think about it for a while, they say, I know. And then they present the scheme they've come up with, with how a person is going to be saved, whether or not it's counting beads or doing Hail Marys or not doing anything at all. Those are the schemes that men have concocted. And so they came up, tired to come up with alternate routes to salvation. But I'm going to ask you, how is this different than what Peter had done himself? The Lord says, here's how it's going to happen. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to raise on the third day. And Peter says, no, no, no. Let's substitute that with another scheme. You see, he put this idea into practice later on. We read about it in John chapter 18, but particularly in Matthew's account, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 51, behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest. Peter was operating on that doctrine, that previous misunderstanding. He was trying to enact his own scheme rather than the one that the Lord had already revealed to him. And that's exactly what people are doing today. The kingdom doesn't come by violence, and that's what Peter was trying to do. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, he says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I wish that people would study this and understand it. You hadn't saved yourself by cutting off somebody's ear. You haven't saved yourself by denying the plain things that the Lord said about his church in baptism. You haven't saved yourself by doing like Peter, by savoring the things of man rather than things of God. The value of man's estate. What's it worth? Come up with your own scheme. Let's have a, a little exercise. You come up with a way to save yourself from your sins. You can write it on a chalkboard up here and we'll see whether or not it's going to work. I could ask that popular question, how's that working out for you? The problem is the evidence is going to be in a little bit too late for you, isn't it? Sometimes people talk about religious experimentation, and that's the problem I have with it, is that the evidence always comes in too late. How is it that we're going to be saved? Well, it's going to be by grace, through faith, proper faith, the faith we talked about this morning, the faith that works. When you believe God's plan, you bring your life into conformity with it. Peter didn't do that. The Lord had told him, here's how it's going to be. And Peter to bring his life into conformity and say, this is what's going to happen. He tried to come up with another way because it didn't sit well with him. And that's what people do. How is it that you're going to be saved? Sometimes people talk about grace like it's just some sort of nebulous thing. You realize that grace always comes in the form of a plan. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 14, we learn about Noah. We learned previously about how Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You know what God did with that grace? He handed Noah some blueprints. Because grace always comes in the form of a plan. If Noah had faith, he would have been saved by grace. Because his faith would have led him to build the boat that God said to build. That's real faith and that's how it is saved. You can sit around and ask whether or not Noah deserved those blueprints. The answer is he didn't. That's why it's grace. The grace of God comes teaching us that we're supposed to deny the worldliness of this world and we're supposed to be faithful to God. And so it is that we can understand keeping man's thoughts in the right place. What is it that you're going to accomplish? Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. He said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesses. What can you accomplish that's going to purchase your salvation? This is the last point. The disciples learn the value of a soul. I already talked about it. It was the blood of Jesus Christ. But let's say that you don't believe that. You're going to stand before God in the judgment? You're going to answer for yourself? What are you going to offer? You're going to start a barter system? Sometimes people bargain with God. God, if you just get me through this, I will... What are you bargaining with? You already owe him everything. You had a chance with your life. You ruined it. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's soiled. It's no good. It's worthless. What are you going to offer him? 
What does Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26 say? For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? In that day, he'll offer everything. But it's all going to be worth nothing. Because you can do it the Lord's way, or there's no way. Because he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Maybe you're here this afternoon, you're not a member of the Lord's church. It belongs to him. It's the one he purchased with his blood. It's the one that bears his name. You need to get into Christ. The Lord himself will add you to that church if you comply with his doctrine. Do you believe his doctrine? It's revealed to us in his word. It's a simple thing to understand it. It's a difficult thing to live by it. But that's why we have grace, isn't it? Because if I determine to do what God said to do, I comply with his doctrine concerning getting into the church. When I ask my Heavenly Father for forgiveness, He can forgive me because He's faithful and just. Now, if you're one of God's children, you've gone astray, you have that opportunity this afternoon. If you've gone astray and it's public, come forward, make a public confession. We'll pray with you, we'll pray for you, and the Lord who is faithful will forgive you of your sins. If you're subject to the invitation of Jesus Christ, come now as together we stand and sing.